Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am Nick Chase from Morantis, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, What's New in OpenStack Pike? Um, our speakers today will be Kevin Benton, Rico Lynn, Eric Cow, and myself, uh, Principal Engineer here at Morantis. He is also the PTL for the OpenStack Neutron Project, um, which, uh, it, which means that he has already forgotten more about networking than I have ever known. Hello, Kevin. Hello. <laughs> Rico is the PTL for the OpenStack Heat Project and a software engineer at EasyStack. Uh, he's been a core contributor since the Liberty Cycle and is an expert in both OpenStack and containers. Hey, Rico. Hi, Nick. Hi, everyone. Hey. Uh, Eric is the PTL for the Congress project, and he is a software engineer at VMware. He is a specialist in policy-based solutions, among other things. Eric, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. Hello, everyone. And as for me, I am the head of technical and marketing content here at Morantis, as well as the editor-in-chief of the Open, Open Cloud Digest bi-weekly newsletter. So, uh, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a window something like this one. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the questions pane, and we'll collect them all and answer as many of them as we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, and speaking of questions, let me get one out of the way right now. Yes, you will get a link to the slides, and you will also get a link to a recording of the webinar. So if you get interrupted or your three-year-old decides to flush your phone down the toilet during the webinar, uh, you'll be able to come back later and see what you missed. Now, uh, as far as our agenda, it's pretty straightforward. We're just going to go through each project and let you know some of the highlights of what's new in uh, the OpenStack Pike release. We are not going to cover everything because there are literally thousands of changes that go into each release. But uh, as I said, we're going to hit the highlights. Now, as for which projects, you'll notice that this list is quite a bit shorter than the Okada webinar. And this is for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the OpenStack community has been kind of, uh, I don't know if I'd say pulling back from the Big Tent philosophy, but you know, some projects have been sort of downgraded. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, so we've, we've kind of dropped them out of this webinar. Well, so we didn't think anybody really enjoys hearing somebody speed talking about tech topics for an entire hour. So uh, we went through the OpenStack use survey, user survey and uh, chose some of the most commonly used projects to cover. Now, if we're missing your favorite, please go ahead and drop it into the comments. And, and uh, if we can say anything about it at the end, we, we certainly will do that. So basically, we're going to take turns here. I'm going to cover a few projects. Then Kevin's going to talk about Neutron. And then back to me until Eric tells us what's new in Congress. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And, and uh, 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 Rico's going to tell us about heat. And, uh, and then I'll close this out, and, and we'll take questions. So uh, we've got a pretty good list going here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, first off, we have the OpenStack Compute Service, or, or NOVA. Um, now, uh, the last time we talked about uh, Cells v2 and, and how it was going to, it was coming up, but only in the form of single cell deployments. Now, in Pike, the default is still a single cell cluster, but uh, now you have the option of doing multiple cells. So let's take a quick moment and, and look at how all that works. So we have the uh, Nova API. And which which communicates with the API database, of course, uh, and also with Nova Scheduler uh, through the message queue. Now, the message queue provides communication between the scheduler and Nova Conductor, um, which communicates with the cell database, which notes where workloads are scheduled, and and the cell zero database, which records workloads that failed to be scheduled. Uh, the message queue also relays messages to uh, Nova Compute. Now, for a multi-cell deployment, obviously this gets more complicated, but the general idea is the same. Uh, each node has its own Nova Compute, Nova Conductor, and, and message queue as, as usual, but it also has its own cell database that records the information about each workload. So meanwhile, if we move up a layer, now we have this uh, superconductor and the API message queue that coordinate all the communications between all the pieces. 
Um, now, it's important to note that the services that are in these boxes here, uh, the red box and the blue box, um, they can't communicate directly with the API via RPC. So make sure you take that into consideration when you're architecting your system. Now, also, uh, because of all these changes, the quota information has moved to the API database. Now, basically, what they're trying to do is decouple the cells from the API as much as possible, you know, which makes sense. Uh, and, and of course, now that this is in place, uh, cells v1 has been deprecated, and you can expect it to go away within the next couple of releases. So, uh, moving on from cells, if you have PCI compliant hardware, you probably have workloads that you want to run on it. So, uh, you can now use the PCI wear wear to uh, make sure that workloads that don't need that hardware are scheduled elsewhere so that you can free up that capacity uh, for when you do need it. To make this work, basically you need to use the PCI uh, weight multiplier configuration option in the uh, filter scheduler section of your Nova Conf file. Um, uh, another new feature in Pike is the ability for nodes to automatically disable themselves uh, if for some reason the workloads are failing to build. Now, how this works is you set the maximum number of consecutive failures that you want to tolerate, and once the node gets to that point, uh, it, it sets itself as unschedulable, basically, so that an operator can look at the node and see what's going on. This way you don't continually send workloads to a node that can't uh, accommodate them. Um, and uh, while we're on topic of scheduling, so the, the placement API, of course, is involved in making more intelligent choices on where workloads get scheduled. Uh, and, and one of the improvements in Pike is the addition of traits. Uh, traits enable you to set certain, well, traits, <laughs> resources. And the placement API can then use those traits to decide whether to, uh, to schedule a workload in that particular place. Uh, another useful change in Pike is the ability to control whether or not uh, you see hypervisor signatures. Now, certain hypervisors have certain signatures, as you can see here for uh, KVM and, and Zen. But this can cause you a problem because there are some drivers that don't want to run on those particular hypervisors. So uh, to get around that problem, you can actually go ahead and hide that signature using the glance metadata for the image that you're using. But what you need to remember, though, is that's not necessarily going to solve your problem. Um, for example, it, it may allow the NVIDIA driver to run on KVM when it doesn't really want to, but um, there's no guarantee it's going to work in every case because there may be situations where those restrictions are there for good reasons. Um, also, on a multi-CPU system, you can now specify uh, that you want to reserve a certain number of CPUs just for the host OS so that the host OS itself runs properly. Okay, and, and basically just a few miscellaneous improvements here uh, that sort of rose to the top. Uh, for example, it used to be that before you could add or change a resource class, you had to check whether it existed and then do a post if it didn't and in order to add it and then put a put if it did in order to update it. Um, now you can just do a put and if it doesn't exist, it'll be created automatically. Okay, so um, that's it for Nova. Um, now let's talk about what's new in uh, block storage with Cinder. Okay, so, um, so for some time you've had the ability to create snapshots of a volume, but uh, what good is that if you can't actually revert to that snapshot? So uh, now you can, both in the Cinder client and in the OpenStack client. Basically, you just need to know the ID for the snapshot that you are reverting to. Um, okay, so now this is another one that uh, I really like, and that is the ability to uh, extend the size of a volume while it's actually in use. Uh, before, you'd have to disconnect it and extend it, but uh, now if the back, end, the back end supports it, uh, you can extend the volume uh, while it's in use using the Limpert driver. So 
um, that is um, certainly handy. Now, um, next we have a couple of operational conveniences. Um, if you've got a fairly consistent environment, you can use the uh, backend default section to set it for all of your backends rather than having to uh, set it individually for each backend. Uh, also, you can let users define groups of volumes to be replicated to a secondary backend as opposed to having to rely on the operator or administrator to back up an entire backend. So uh, you do need to check and see whether your particular backend supports that though. Uh, and of course, it's a new release of Cinder, so we have some new drivers and some drivers that may be removed. Now, uh, the reason that this list of unsupported drivers is so long is that the Cinder project is being, they're pretty strictly enforcing the requirements for you know testing and and uh, all of that. So um, these, so all of these drivers are unsupported because their their particular vendors have not complied with those requirements. So they're unsupported in this release, and if that's not fixed, they will be removed. So if you're using any of these um, particular drivers, um, you're going to want to get with the vendor and make sure they do what they need to do uh, to prevent that. And of course, uh, now that the uh, Cinder v3 API is functional, v2 uh, is officially deprecated. All right, now, uh, moving on to Glance. So uh, Pike, it, so in Pike you have uh, a new experimental capability called the interoperable image import. And, and what that means is it's basically a way to provide bits to Glance and have Glance create an image for you rather than starting up an instance and, and saving it from there. And then there, there's lots of good reasons why you'd want to do that. Um, there are some options that you need to make sure to set up in your configuration, and you can find that information uh, documented in the glanceapi.com file. Now, uh, interoperable image import requires the Glance Tasks API, but you don't want to expose that to users directly, and thankfully you don't have to. So uh, what you can do is configure Glance uh, so that's not necessary, and, and you can see the relevant parameters here. And obviously, you're going to want to check the documentation for more. Um, quick security note, the Glance team wants to point out that this is a good time to review your policy.json file to make sure that if you have a default target, it's pretty restrictive. Uh, the reason that you want to do this is that when you have a new release, there's a good chance that there will be targets that aren't in the old policy.json file, which means that it's going to fall back on the default. So, uh, you know, if you have a default that's open, um, you're going to be basically open up a big old security hole. So you're going to want to check on that and make sure you're good to go. All right. So. Uh, to talk about HEAT, the OpenStack Orchestration Service, we have the HEAT PTL, Rico Lin. Thank you so much for joining us, Rico. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So, uh, so in the uh, Pike release, uh, we have uh, 80 uh, contributors and 132 reviewers help. And so we fixed 108 bugs and seven blueprints and a huge number of refactors. And turn out that uh, we have made it uh, more stable and uh, valuable through the Pi release. Uh, this in, uh, this improvements has effect on the both old designs of the heat backends. And uh, as you might know, that heat has a distributed backend that we call convergence. So uh, uh, we encourage you guys to uh, anyone trying to use the uh, the Pi. Uh, heat, uh, uh, I mean heat from Pike release will so definitely uh, will encourage to enable the convergence, and uh, and wh and which the convergence engine it was default uh, enabled uh, since uh, Newton release. So for some update of new features that we have included in more uh, in more resource from uh, 
from Newtons that we have enabled trunk resources. And so you can do in the trunk for the networking if you know it. Also that we have input on the on the segmentations of the neutron. So you, right now you can using the heat resource, to, uh, neutron resource inside of heat template to enable the segmentations, which should be fine. And uh, for like for Markdown resources, we have like uh, we have up to date to is the new uh, capacity of the uh, Markdown cluster. So you can create a new cluster resources with a uh, heat. Uh, we also have very consistent co work with the Markdown team that we're trying to improve the, re uh, the clustering resource inside of a heat structure. So uh, we will do more, we will do a lot in the pipe release, and we'll do more in the in Queens. And uh, uh, if your environment has uh, Mistral installed it, uh, uh, we have a new um, resource from uh, Mistral. is a uh, it's actually uh, a customized resource uh, which implemented inside of Heat, but we're using the Mistral workflow and. Uh, so you can customize your own resource type with it, and uh, there's a, consider it as a, another way that you can create your own customized resource. And this will help you to manage the workflow, and we will talk about some samples later. Uh, also, we also have the ZOM uh, container resources implemented, and uh, some uh, nice function and logic that you can you can use like uh, the list concat unicorns and uh, contents. So you can use those uh, those functions and uh, inside of your heat template, which will make your uh, your heat template that we call it hot. You you can uh, make the hot script like uh, more smart uh, and uh, easy to use. Okay, uh, next slide. Thank you. And. Uh, for what we have, what we have spoke about in the in the last slide that we have a customer resource. So uh, we will do some examples here to to explain how it works. Since uh, it's kind of very interesting features that uh, that is uh, I think is quite useful. So uh, so to use these external resources, you will you can see in the in the slide that uh, you just have to. Uh, define it, the types inside of your uh, hot script, and which you have to define the create, update, and uh, suspend, and uh, return and delete. That's what we have support supported for now. And for those actions that you actually can define, like very differently each time. So you will have uh, you will have uh, like a different behavior for the for this customized resource depends on what you need inside your environment. Uh, next slide. So as you can see that uh, what we named it as a Kubernetes create. And I mean we're trying to create a Kubernetes resource. So here you have is a Kubernetes create uh, Mistral workflow. And what this workflow do is that it define the creation uh, process of your resource. So when you're re when you're trying to create a a, a heat template that uh, your and your customized resource inside, it will it will trigger the list create flows and and trying to use this uh, procedures to create your own resource, which you define the uh, update and delete the same way. So uh, it will it will like find out the ways that you want to delete or update. Your resources and and uh, do with the uh, workflow do, and what this workflow do is that very simple. It just uh, grab the output of the stake, which trying to find it, uh, and it published to trying to find the VNs IP, and at the end that it trying to run the SSH to to that IP and to trying to create uh, the, the Kubernetes cluster uh, is inside of your nodes. Which uh, probably very, I, I would say, is a uh, very basic but useful for the Kubernetes management. Uh, so we consider this as as a sample that uh, you can actually use in this kind of stuff, doing a lot of things 
and uh, uh, mistral workflows will help you to, to uh, manage the flow processes. So it's, it's uh, very powerful. And uh, uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, that's another thing that we call it, uh, we call uh, uh, Converge. Uh, Converge is about to get the reality of your uh, environments. So you can use the Converge flag to update the API request and that uh, the update actions will actually pull the resource from the services like Nova server or single volume and the update will against the reality. So the example is when you when trying to update when you're trying to update a server, I mean the Nova instances, the Nova instance, maybe you're trying to uh, update from flavor uh, one to flavor two, but the 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 heat can 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 find out that okay, this this re, this Nova instance is already using the flavor two, so it will actually not doing the update of the flavor, which Will, will help you to manage the resource and, inter and integrity of the resource. And, and the, other, the other thing that this is using is that when you're trying to update from the flavor one to, to like uh, not change, I mean, I mean you're trying to update other things but not the flavor, but the Nova instances will, uh, the inside of heat will detect that, okay, uh, somebody uh, in the reality is actually update this instance to uh, flavor two, so it will help you to update back. So this is what 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 uh, this is what this feature do, and uh, uh, and uh, for for a lot of things like a huge number of resource managements and to prevent other other operators trying to take over the control right of your uh, clustering resources. So this is very useful. And this is right now. This only support for APIs. You can update. You can use in update APIs and with uh, this converge flag. But we will have the uh, we will have the common eye support. Uh, I I believe will be in uh, will be landed in uh, early queens. So stay tuned. So yeah, that's all I have. Thanks, all guys. Right. Great. Thank you so much, Rico. We really appreciate that. Uh, all right, so uh, let's move on to Horizon. Um, as you know, Horizon is the OpenStack dashboard, which enables you to pretty much avoid having to do things on the command line. Uh, but for lots of people, Horizon is also a great place to get the uh, OpenRC file, which is a file of environment variables that lets you easily configure the OpenStack client. Um, of course, now the community is moving towards the unified OpenStack client, which has its own config file, which is the uh, clouds.yaml file. Uh, and in Pike, you can now download that from the same screen as uh, the uh, OpenRC file. Uh, Horizon has also made some improvements to managing the launch process. Uh, you can set defaults for creating an image as well as setting the default decision on whether to create a volume when uh, launching an image, uh, launching an instance rather. Uh, also, one more thing to note, as of Pike, the ability to edit flavors using Horizon is disabled by default. Uh, you can go ahead and re-enable it, but keep in mind that it's deprecated and it will be removed in the R cycle. Um, another usability change here, if you are not using a public cloud, you can go ahead and specify um, the, uh, the, dom the different domains that should appear in a pull down uh, when the user is logging into Horizon. Well, I mean, well, you can do it for a public cloud too, but that is a terrible idea because it's a huge security risk. So don't do that. Um, Finally, uh, we're getting a lot more uh, control over port security in Pike, uh, at, at, or at least the ability to edit it uh, via Horizon. Um, first off, when you're creating security rules, you can now set any port and any protocol, which is, is convenient. Um, you can also associate a security group with a specific port rather than uh, an instance. And, uh, also, in line with Neutron's push to make networking easier, you can also create and delete ports right in the Horizon interface uh, and turn their security on and off. 
Um, just keep in mind that you can only disable security on a port if it doesn't have any security groups currently assigned to it. Okay, so uh, that's it for Horizon. Uh, really just kind of a couple of quick notes on Keystone. Uh, the Keystone project has uh, been working on including default policies in code, which means that um, you don't have to worry about managing so many different parameters in your configuration. Basically, you can still override them by setting them explicitly, uh, but if they're not there, Keystone will just you know, fall back on the default. Uh, also, they've uh, been working on improving security and testing this go around. Uh, you know, for example, they're using a more secure hashing mechanism on uh, the SQL back end. Okay, so that is it for Keystone. Um, now let's hear about what's new in Neutron from Kevin. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so so starting out, I'll start with a kind of an easy change here. Uh, like most of the other services in OpenStack, Neutrina has support for setting limits on how many resources a particular project uh, might consume. You know, you might set limits for this project can have two networks, 10 floating IPs, et cetera. Um, so the main limitation with the quota API was that you could get the limits for a given tenant, but you couldn't tell how many resources were actually in use by that tenant. The only way to do that was to list all the resources and then kind of manually count the results yourself. So this wasted a whole bunch of API calls because if you wanted to see all the resources a specific tenant had, you had to do X number of listing calls uh, for each resource type. And this wastes a lot of computation on the server side too. So starting in Pike, we have a new quota details API where um, you can get the limits and how many uh, how many items are in use and out of the limit and that kind of stuff. And you can see that in the in the slide here, the detail API is on the right there, and then the old regular API is on the left. All right. Uh, next here we have the uh, support for setting uh, DNS domains on individual Neutron ports. So. Um, Neutron has the ability to store uh, host name on ports and uh, DNS name on networks up until Pike. And this information gets relayed to uh, external DNS service like Designate, and it's also used um, for internal name resolution that goes down to the DHCP servers inside of Neutron. Um, uh, until Pike, the limitation was that all the ports that are on a given network had to be part of the same, uh, they all had to be part of the same domain. And this was pretty limiting because you might have a whole bunch of web servers on a single network that all have different domains. So um, during Pike, we added the ability to set a domain name on each individual port. So each port on a network can have its own custom complete DNS name. Um, a, quite a bit of effort was spent in the probably like the Newton Newton Mataka time frame to get all the MTU calculations correct inside a Neutron. Make sure. Um, all the all the agents were setting it correctly, that kind of stuff. Um, however, this MTU value is coming from a global configuration. Uh, this this works fine for most cases, but there's scenarios where operators want to have large MTUs by default across all the networks, but then they might have a particular network that's uh, um, constantly communicating with other devices on other small MTU networks, and they don't want the difference to happen between the two because then you have these MTU path discovery problems. So in Pike, you now have the ability to set an MTU override for a given network. You can turn it down. Um, for user user facing features, interacting with the API, in addition to that quota quota change, um, we expanded the uh, expanded the tags feature to um, uh, several other resources. So Neutron has this feature where users can add tags to the resources. They're just simple strings. They don't affect the behavior of Neutron or how traffic flows or anything like that. They, they might add like a production tag to one network or um, maybe another tag that indicates that, hey, all traffic on this network should be um, development only, that kind of stuff. And so this has been expanded on to in, from sub, just network subnets and ports to include uh, floating IPs, security groups, security group rules, segments, trunks, and uh, role-based access control policies. Um, there's uh, several DVR improvements that happened during this cycle. Um, uh, one of the main things is 
DVR now has the option to allow the centralized network node to handle floating IP translations for certain types of traffic. Um, while this uh, kind of sounds like a regression because now you're moving some stuff back to the central network node, it, it allowed two use cases that have come up several times that we haven't been able to do with DVR. Uh, first, it allows uh, uh, virtual router redundancy protocol scenarios, so where two VMs are uh, offering high availability to a single IP address. Um, this didn't this didn't work with DVR because DVR would only allow floating IPs to like a port that belonged to a, a single host, and that wasn't the case in these scenarios. But now with this change, uh, DVR will be able to support that. Additionally, there's a lot of uh, there. Well, there's some deployments where um, operators can't get the external network pushed all the way out to a compute node, so they still want DVR for the east-west traffic in their data center, but they um, can't get the external network there, so they need the floating IP traffic to go through a centralized network node. So we support that now too. Um, additionally, there's um, this new DVR fast exit routing where um, if you have a deployment setup where DVR is routing between internal and external networks that are part of the same address scope, um, traffic will now be routed directly onto the external network by the compute node. Uh, previously, traffic would go through the central node if there wasn't a floating IP translation, even if there was no um, network address translation needed since they're on the same address scope. Um, so the quality of service API now supports uh, bandwidth late rate limit rules. So for example, you can set rules that limit how much upload and download bandwidth is allowed um, on a per network basis or even on individual port basis. So you can say 10 megabits upload and 100 megabits download and then um, the Neutron agents will set up rules that will enforce that kind of stuff. Uh, so support for ingress and egress bandwidth limit rules was added to both the OVS and Linux bridge drivers that are in the Neutron tree and support for egress bandwidth limit rules was added to the SRLV driver. Uh, now, since there's differences between which backends support which types of bandwidth rules, there's also a new API that users can use to determine which rules are available to um, to the user based on whatever backends are loaded. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay. Hang on a second, I seem to be, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so um, we now have a, a rolling upgrade support from in the Okada to Pike upgrades. So that means that you can leave the um, leave the Okada Neutron servers running, do the database expansion, start bringing online Pike Neutron servers, add them to a load balancer pool, and then once you have Pike servers online, then you can shut down the Okada servers. So you can have zero downtime upgrades now uh, with with Neutron. Um, Python, Python 3 support, uh, uh, we worked through um, all the, I thought all the Python 3 bugs we could find uh, during the cycle, um, but it's still very new and it doesn't have the same test coverage quite yet as uh, Python 2. So if you want to use it, um, it should work, but you know, adopt it with caution. Um, and then uh, if you're using routed networks, the DHP agent now supports um, serving remote, uh, remote DHCP requests that are coming from other segments of a routed network. So this allows operators to use um, use DHCP relay and avoid setting up DHCP servers on every single uh, routed segment in the routed segment deployment topology. Um, so there's kind of several uh, high, high level improvements to stability and performance. Um, the, OVS, the OVS communication pattern, the OVS agent communication pattern between the the server and the agent's been improved to where whenever there's like a network update or a port update, all that information that's relevant to that is pushed out as part of the update. So the OVS agent doesn't have to turn around and uh, pull the server again. And so this uh, makes the load a lot more consistent on the Neutron servers. Um, lots of fixes went into the OVS uh, flow-based firewall that was new, new during the Okada cycle. So it's becoming a pretty stable alternative now the IP tables based firewall, which will offer um, um, much better performance than the IP tables one if you need uh, very high bandwidth uh, applications. Um, additionally, the uh, we swapped out um, 
the neutron uh, Python based namespace proxy to use uh, HA proxy instead and this uh, significantly significantly reduces the memory footprint of the um, of the metadata agent that's running on uh, network node or compute node or wherever you have it and then uh, finally we have this we have a new uh, uh, compare and swap feature that was added to the neutron API so if you have an external service uh, like heat for example or any other kind of external orchestration service that's trying to um, update a neutron resource um, from one state to another state it can set these conditional uh, parameters to make sure that there wasn't another update that happened at the same time that he did okay and uh, uh, there's there's all I just want one more thing I wanted to mention so all, all this stuff was focused on kind of what went into the main uh, neutron repo and there was actually there's quite a bit quite a few more things like in the neutron stadium like firewalls as a service VPN as a service networking OVN that all had quite a few updates too so you'll have to watch watch the mailing list for changes on on those great okay, okay. well thank you so much Kevin uh, yep. really appreciate that like I said I, I told y'all he's forgotten more about network than I networking than I've ever known so um, all right, so let's go back to storage. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Swift. Um, so uh, one of the things we've been talking about in the last couple of releases is erasure codes, which make it possible to sort of know mathematically if something's been damaged or corrupted and to regenerate it. Um, and what this does is it, it allows you to get by with fewer copies um, while still having the same uh, reliability. In, in Pike, we have the advent of globally distributed erasure codes, which are interesting because each region can operate independently, even if the network between the regions is down. But if there's a problem in one region, the other region can be used to help recover the data. So basically, this means uh, easier recovery and better performance for ingesting new capacity. And, and the Swift team has been. Uh, working on there's there's a lot of changes behind the scenes that they needed to do to make that happen and uh, that was during this cycle so um, moving on to telemetry um, the telemetry projects are really mostly in maintenance mode at this point uh, so the main thing is some additional support for uh, Manila which is the OpenStack file service and also for uh, SDN controllers uh, and other than that, we have some uh, deprecations and removals. Okay, um, next we have Designate, which is the uh, DNS as a service project. Um, what we have for Pike is that you can now schedule uh, across different DNS pools uh, using filters. Uh, also, by default, um, the V1 API, which is deprecated, has been turned off. Um, you can still use it, however. Um, to do that, you, you can go ahead and turn it back on by setting uh, Enable API V1 to True in the Service API section of your configuration. Uh, all right. Um, in terms of bare metal provisioning, we do have a few interesting developments in Pike. Um, first of all, uh, you can now boot from a cinder volume, just like you can with a VM, which is pretty cool, actually, if you ask me. Uh, also, Ironic can now uh, recognize physical networks rather than just virtual ones. Uh, there's a good deal of configuration you need to take into account here, um, so make sure that you check into that. But um, let's face it, if you're using Ironic, you're up into your elbows anyway. So. Um, just take a good look at what's going on there. Uh, also, we've been talking about rolling upgrades in other services for a while now, and uh, now you can do them with Ironic as well. There's definitely a very specific procedure, though, so uh, you're going to want to check that out carefully before you get started. On the container front, one of our avenues is the Magnum project, uh, which manages container orchestration engines, or uh, COEs. Uh, first, there's a new swarm driver that you can set up using the COE field in the cluster template. Um, next, you can now set up Magnum so that if you're using Kubernetes, uh, you automatically get the Kubernetes dashboard for the cluster you're creating. 
Um, same thing for the basic monitoring stack. As you can see here, it's made up of you know, various pieces. Uh, and if you enable that, you will also get, uh, you're, you're gonna go ahead and get the basic uh, Grafana dashboard. Now, as far as the containers themselves, you can now use Cinder as storage volumes for Docker, which is convenient for application developers. Um, there's a whole new configuration section for Cinder in magnum.conf uh, that uh, enables you to go ahead and set the volume type. Now, uh, of course, when you have the cluster, you want to do things with it, and now you have the ability to let the cluster communicate with other OpenStack services and not just with Magnum. Now, for security reasons, the uh, default is false, but you can set uh, cluster user trust to uh, true to go ahead and turn that on. But before you do, uh, we need to point out that using this basically gives your cluster access to your entire OpenStack project, all the resources in it. So, uh, you know, if you're comfortable with that, that's okay, but uh, keep that in mind. Okay, and speaking of policies, that brings us to Congress. Eric, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so, um, Congress, uh, what is Congress? Congress is an open policy framework for managing the data center. And what it does is it takes SQL-like policy rules as input and interacts with the various services in your stack to monitor and enforce that policy. Now, some of the pipe highlights, you know, that we focus on are, are usability, performance, and robustness improvements. And I'll mention a couple today. So, on the next slide, uh, first thing, one of the big problems people have starting out with Congress is that the policy language is very flexible and very open. And it also takes some learning curve to be able to write useful policy to start out. So in Pike, we integrated a library of useful policies for users to customize and to activate. Now you can immediately get value out of Congress before even knowing the policy language. And here is a uh, small sample of some of them. Um, on the next slide, another Pike feature to highlight is the monitoring panel. And with the monitoring panel, the user can see at a quick glance a summary of the policy violations in their stack. The user can then also drill down into each violation for more details and causes. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, we're in the final stretch now. I'm going to get through the last few projects, and, uh, and then we will try and take some questions. Um, talking about Murano, the application catalog. Uh, Murano's been putting default policies in code, which we talked about what that means when we were talking about Keystone. Uh, also, users can now encrypt and decrypt sensitive information by interfacing with the OpenStack Barbican uh, project. Users also have uh, more control over which volumes and networks they are using. All right, now we haven't talked about Sahara in a while, but big data is even more of a thing than it used to be, uh, and Sahara is still chugging along. So uh, they have a new image generation system. Uh, they're still using Disk Image Builder, but they've started on this new system uh, with Cloudera as their first go around. Uh, and of course, they have new versions of the various pieces that they use, and they have deprecated and removed older versions. And our last project of the day, Mistral uh, Task Flow as a Service. Um, they have been working on their new Actions API, which uh, enables users to spread tasks across regions. It's also a bit easier to use than before because it runs right in the engine rather than uh, having to set up external executors. Basically, there's more control and the ability to create more elaborate workflows, which is good because if you remember uh, from Rico's discussion, we're referencing these workflows from Heat and other places. Okay, so that brings us to the end uh, of all of our projects. So uh, we've already got a few questions. So uh, if you have not asked your question yet, please go ahead 
and ask it in the uh, questions pane. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and try and answer as many of these as we can. So um, let's, uh, let's start with, uh, we have a question here about heat. Rico, what is the difference between convergence mode and original mode in heat? Oh yeah, thanks, Nick. So, uh, so we we uh, you guys have heard about the convergent mode that we just I just spoke about, and ensure that uh, in the, in the original design of heat that uh, for example you 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 uh, you put a heat template inside of a your heat environments, and the heat environment will pick one node. I mean one heat engine, heat backend. We call it engine. So one heat engine to process the entire stack. I mean the entire template into a stack that contains all your resources. And it just we just use that lab engines to, to process entirely. Of course that you can have like for example, like five users to, to operate together and and create five different stake and they will use five different engines, but they're still not smart or not. And in convergence mode that uh, what we have is that uh, we separate those operations from uh, stake uh, as a unit into a resource as a unit. So your your environment right now, if you enable it, uh, if you enable the convergence mode, uh, it would it would like it would separate the operation into resources. So, like for example, if you have uh, five uh, you have five uh, engine, uh, heat engine services inside of your environments, and it will it will allow you to create five resources at the same time. So think about that entirely. It will cut the uh, creation times or operation times of any uh, any resource actions to to like show like a lot of a uh, swing down. So it will it will help a lot, but in a, in a, in your performance, also in a, in a stable, stabilized things that you 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 only you only need like short times to to create entirely. So yeah, that, that's what uh, convergence is. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Rico. All right, um, Eric. Uh, what advantages does Congress offer beyond policies encapsulated in each individual service? Right. So uh, all these services in open stack have, you know, their own individual policies that uh, govern their behavior. And so what does Congress offer beyond that? Well, uh, one question, is, uh, one answer is that it supports policy that needs to span multiple services. For example, if you guys look at a uh, slide 64, there's an example there of, uh, let's say you want to say that servers with unencrypted storage must have strict networking isolation. So that spans, you know, a storage service and networking service. And you could, there could, might be, you might be, you might want to make positive decisions based on any combination of things, storage, network, uh, what VM image you're using, some other kind of threat monitoring service, for example. And that it's really hard to do uh, within each individual service cycle. So that's something Congress offers. And then um, something else that comes with it is that you get a unified policy formalism and repository for governing behavior that you can go and look at. Uh, on the other hand, it's really hard to look at the um, uh, a bunch of silos and figure out how the uh, overall behavior is governed. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, Kevin, this one's for you. Anything in Pike jump out as a boon to OpenStax capabilities in NFV? Yeah, so um, I can I can speak to this mainly from the uh, the Neutron perspective. We have have had quite a quite a bit of focus on um, uh, for one data plane performance has been a big thing. That was what drove a lot of the uh, OVS OVS firewall effort. So you can get you know. 20 gigabits a second or whatever high performance networking without getting the, the kernel in the way of your traffic. Um, in, in addition to that, there's also uh, VLAN aware VMs in Neutron, which is, it, it, it didn't land this cycle, but it's, um, it, it's meant to enable a lot of NFV use cases where you have instances that need to attach to tons of networks. And then on the Nova side, 
um, I'm not sure of the details, but there's been a lot of um, there, there's been a lot of work on the Nova side to help uh, scheduling uh, scheduling hardware uh, for high performance use cases like that. The PCI the PCI schedule that you brought up and the uh, the new um, placement APIs and uh, NUMA pinning and that kind of stuff so um, there's there's been a lot of focus on NFB between both uh, uh, Neutron and I think even more heavily on the Nova side to enable a lot of NFB use cases. Awesome thank you and, and by that way um, that that question was was asked by uh, Brandon Wick who I, I want to thank for uh, OPNFV's support of the uh, understanding OPNFV book that that we now have out. So uh, if you want to if you want to find that, uh, let us know and we'll send you <laughs> we'll send you a link to that book that we did. Um, all right, let's see here. So while we're on the topic of NFV, um, so Kevin, um, would you say that uh, those features that you were just talking? Uh, are enhancements for onboarding of um, uh, VNFs? Um, I so I, I guess it in in this context uh, onboarding VNFs. Well, yeah, if, if um, get, getting the performance guarantees that are required, it helps in in that regard. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by onboarding. If if he's talking about more man, managing or uh, bringing bringing in legacy systems, um, I don't know if there's any features that are specific to that. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think it, yeah, it's mainly just that you can you can now have a lot better hardware and performance guarantees. Um, if that answers the question, I'm not sure if it yes. quite gets what they're looking for. <laughs> okay, well we'll we'll do the best we can. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, are there any changes in Manila? Yeah, actually there were a ton of uh, changes in Manila. Um, let me see if I can kind of rattle off some of them. Um, there's, uh, they, they worked on the uh, consistent snapshot uh, code for the NetApp driver. Um, the NetApp ONTAP driver um, was fixed um, so that uh, the security style is always an FS. Um, there's a new EMC Entity plugin, uh, Unity uh, EMC Unity plugin, um, so you can create a, an NFS CIFS share uh, with a Unity backend. Uh, you can filter shares and share instances uh, with the export location ID or the path. Uh, let's see. So there's there's a bunch. Um, the best place to go um, there's there's a uh, like filter support and shares snapshots uh, share networks share groups. Uh, there's the best place to find the sort of raw changes is is in the release notes. Um, but those are some of the things that. Uh, have kind of jumped out at me, um, including a, also validation of IP6 based addresses. So um, let's see. So that's what kind of jumps out at me on that. Uh, Rico, do you know why OpenStack recently removed apps.openstack.org? I now I have some thoughts on that. I don't know what I want yeah. to say about it, but <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I do. But maybe uh, since Marantis has the most active actions uh, around that, maybe you guys have something to update as well. So from my perspective, is that uh, that app uh, that app uh, OpenStack.org is closed because that it is something similar with what happened to the big tens, is that. Uh, we figure out we use we can it consume too much uh, too much of uh, resources and uh, they not didn't do what we expect to do like uh, for for like big ten that is separate all the all the developer resources to cross project but it did not make the open stack like uh, uh, the integration the integrate the integration of the I mean the integrity of the entire open stack are stronger. And that's what happened to the applications uh, uh, OpenStack.org is that 
uh, it doesn't contain all the applications that OpenStack is 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 uh is being what's being using or is being using. Like uh, there's no much things to 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 use that that web uh, to to connect with uh, like for NFV use cases. Uh, maybe some of the uh, Kubernetes use, use cases, but definitely not from the Kubernetes uh, the Kubernetes community side. So instead of uh, doing the application by OpenStack itself, we kind of like stay in the in the, like uh, in the infrastructure as a service layer, and we still have uh, um, uh, Murano services, which is still perfect. It's still great. But instead, we have some con we have some uh, concept like uh, open source. So you have the uh, open source stay in the in the summit that we're trying to leverage the entire resource of the, our community. That that's why and there's nothing wrong with doing applications in OpenStack. Just maybe not the main focus for the OpenStack community. So uh, maybe something from the Meritus side. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I think I think you pretty much summed it up. I mean, it, one thing that the, that the OpenStack community has, uh, has been, I, I, I would say criticized for, but one thing that's been talked about is, oh, you know, it's too unfocused and, you know, there's too much going on. And I think that one of the things that uh, the community has been doing in the last, you know, six to 12 months is look, taking a hard look at everything and going, all right, <laughs> now, what do we really want to be working on? And um, the the app catalog was, um, you know, a great thing, uh, but it just was decided that it was taking more resources than it was, you know, felt to be uh, returning. So um, the application catalog is still a great thing. And if anybody wants to do one, I'm sure that uh, they could, but that's just not something that the foundation wanted to continue. That's all. All right. Uh, we are out of time. So um, first off, I want to thank all of you who joined us here today, um, both in the audience and also our panelists. Uh, so I want to thank Rico Lin, Eric Cal, and Kevin Benton, our, our, my, my esteemed colleague here. And always, 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 we want to thank Michelle and Yakura um, for um, handling things on the back end, because without her, we would never get any of this done. So, and uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will see you in six months. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.